Welcome to a brand new episode of Seize the Moment podcast. And today we have a very special guest. We have Dr. Daniel Jolly. He's an assistant professor in social psychology at the University of Nottingham, where his research program broadly explores the psychology of conspiracy theories. Daniel has a passion for science communication, and he's been interviewed on various popular TV programs like BBC News, Sky News, CTV, Adam's Ru Adam Ruins Everything, and his work's been featured in the New York Times, CNN, The Atlantic, Huffington Post, Vice, and many more. And it's truly a pleasure to have you on today, and thank you so much for coming on, Daniel. Thank you so much, and thanks for that introduction, that, that list of things I've done. I'm like, oh, yeah, that is true. I did do that. Wow, yeah. It almost sounds so impressive. I'm like, is that really me? <laughs> Honestly, I like that more than when uh, podcasters ask you, oh, can you introduce yourself and tell us about your background? It puts so much pressure on the yes, guests. I never would have said any know. of those things. <laughs> <laughs> so you like I'm dead jolly. Okay, great. I'm like I like learning about this ecology of conspiracy theories. Never actually citing those things. Um, so, so thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, as we were talking about before the podcast, and as I'm, I'm sure our listeners know, we had Nate Gowdy on a couple of weeks ago. And so we started with the conversation of personality types and what sort of people kind of tend to fall into conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of the background here with Nate, he was in the insurrection, he's a photographer for Rolling Stone. And uh, so he was there photographing it. And he kind of was wondering, you know, how is it that some people at, the, at these protests, how is it that some of them seemed kind of normal and were pretty helpful and were seemingly good? I mean, it just seemed like they kind of had, you know, pretty stupid and shitty beliefs. Uh, but how is it that some of them obviously are kind of not that, right? So some of them are pretty aggressive. Uh, some of them are pretty kind of, you know, toxic, for lack of a better term. And so I wonder what you, Daniel, in terms of your research, are you finding that there are certain personalities that are more geared toward conspiracies? Or is it one of those traps that pretty much anyone can fall into? Yeah, and that is a good question to start with. So there isn't a particular type of person who on paper has all these characteristics which makes them more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. I think it's a very complex mix of all different things with our personality, mixed with our environment, mixed with our past experience, that therefore can make someone more susceptible to falling down that rabbit hole. So there are some personality quirks, such as being a, a narcissist, where you see have a real positive image of yourself and your group, and you want to kind of maintain that. Also, the need to feel unique, that you kind of really thrive on having different, unique information that sets you apart from others, but also coupled with feeling anxious and threatened, and in essence, out of control, which can be born out of experience. So, for example, uh, I found that experiences of bullying can make people feel a bit more paranoid, which can therefore make someone more, more conspiratorial. Mm -hmm. Or it could be events in our society. So mentioning COVID already, it's been like two minutes, but COVID is, is kind of a good example of instilling feelings of uncertainty, of, of, of uh, perilousness, which a conspiracy in that moment can offer to try and provide an answer to the complex problem. But then also, as I mentioned, being could experience. So I mentioned bullying, but in essence, it's experiences of feeling that you and your group are a victim. And that could be actual experience of that, or even just the perception, where you then become more hypervigilant to looking out for threat because bad things have happened to you. So you're therefore kind of vigilant to looking out towards the future. So for me, when I, if I was to summarize everything in just a sentence or so, it, it is trying to make sense of a complex world. Really, that's what it kind of boils down to in my mind, that you have a worldview that maybe paints the world in a, in a very conspiratorial way. Everyone's behind the scenes, plotting and scheming. But in essence, it's trying to make sense and understand what is happening. Yeah. Yeah. When I was, I remember, do you want to say something? Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, I find that very interesting because uh, these, these sorts of traumatic experiences, whether it be uh, bullying or even something like the pandemic, which affected millions of people, bi uh, billions of people, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, what's interesting is um, I'm wondering, is it possible that could it be also that believing in conspiracy theories could also make you even more paranoid like could that feed into your paranoia or feed into like a feedback uh, loop right yeah like a sort of feedback loop because it, it i mean i'm sure that those lead you to it but i wonder if a continuous belief in it could feed more into those uh behaviors yeah now, that's a really great question something that we as scholars have thought about as well because if a conspiracy belief offers that simple solution that makes, makes you feel better less anxious well that'd be wonderful ideally having mm -hmm. no consequence would be fantastic but of course, the world is not like that. 
And as you, as you indicate, if someone believes in a conspiracy, it comes to a lot of caveats, as in you believe that the world is full of conspiracies, that there's bad people doing bad things to get you and your group. Well, that's not a very positive view of the world, of course. So it actually is going to increase your distrust of others. It actually has been shown to make you feel more anxious and more threatened. And although there's no work demonstrating the paranoia point, I must confess, I can certainly imagine it would kind of hypervigilant, make, make you more susceptible to think that these things are happening. So mm -hmm. often scholars call this a, a, form, a, a thing of they seem appealing, but they're not satisfying. So they kind of draw you in, promising you the world, going to explain all these things and actually can make you feel worse, impact your well-being. And of course, I'm sure we'll get to it, but the wider consequences of how you interact with society. So actually, they're not a positive thing for the individual society. They can be quite detrimental. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. And that reminds me. So uh, Dan, do you know who William Cooper was? No. Oh, oh, interesting. Okay. Oh my God. Okay. So in the conspiracy world here in the United States, he was the king. So uh, technically, uh, so you know Alex Jones, obviously. Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay. So uh, so Alex Jones okay. was. Okay. I, I don't want to. I don't want to kind of call him his protege, but Alex yeah, Jones was yeah. kind of on his coattails for a very long time. So Bill Cooper started out in the '80s. So he was this guy who was like a former. Um, I, I'm gonna. I hope I don't butcher this. So I think he was a former in a, a Navy SEAL or some sort of like a military operator. I don't remember exactly. Maybe he was just in the army. But so apparently he said he got hold of these classified documents and he said that like the uh, what's it called which the Bilderberg group like these global summits which obviously yeah. are happening but he said that there was a time when they were happening happening in submarines and essentially like they were having these underground underwater meetings okay so whatever so with Bill Cooper what was so interesting so I was hooked on him for a really long time I loved Bill Cooper mm -hmm. and I remember he had the show called the hour of the time it was on some like alternative radio like you needed to have like AM radio in order to get it because otherwise you couldn't <laughs> find him and what was so interesting about Cooper is he kind of he was brilliant he was a brilliant strategist in terms of media and marketing so the way he built up a show where there were these episodes and little by little he would give you more and more revelations so it's sort of like watching a series like like you know we were talking about earlier like games of game of thrones or whatever right sure. so yeah so as you're listening to his show you're learning little by little and then he's like he, he's kind of not he's not saying it but he's implying that there's some big revelation in the end and i remember pretty much listening to all of his episodes i'm like oh my god what is the thing like what is the secret who is in control and then finally his big revelation yeah finally the big revelation he's like well, this is like what they really don't want you to know. And he's reading like all of these esoteric texts and it's, you know, material from like the Freemasons, the Rosicrucians, whoever. And a lot of this stuff is pretty obscure and it's kind of meaningless in our world. But as he's reading it, he's like, I'm telling you, he's like, as we're going through the text, you're going to finally get to get the picture, see who's in control. And then finally, the big revelation is like, OK, there are these Freemasons who are running the world. Nobody really knows who they are, but they're like controlling the shadow. They are the shadow government and they're controlling the government. But essentially, that was like the big revelation. And as you're listening to all of his shows, eventually, Eventually, you're like, what the fuck? I just spent <laughs> all of my time listening to this for this. Like, this is the big revelation. Who are these people? Where can I find them? We need to get them. We need to get them. Yeah, that's <laughs> brilliant. I was like, tell me, Cooper, what's going on? Yeah. And like, that's kind of what it is a lot of times in these conspiracy yeah. circles. And, yeah. you know, now tying it into the modern day, do you find that that's what's going on with the QAnon conspiracy? That it's like a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but nothing yeah. serious or substantial? But of course, it's like he's asking questions. It's sowing that doubt. And definitely if there's a fertile ground where maybe you have a distrustful personality, but the environment of anxiety, it certainly has a ground to be kind of flourish on. And just while you're talking, I think obviously another caveat, well, not one caveat, another thing to think about is the entertainment value of conspiracy theories. They're really entertaining. They're yes. fun to talk about. And if you are scrolling on Twitter or Facebook or whatever the new thing is today, you and you're exposed to content that is just controversial, exciting, different, that's going to pique your attention. If it's just the mainstream kind of boring mundane answer trying to explain this complex event, you may not be kind of taking a, you know, taking notice of it. But if it's something conspiratorial, something that suggests that's kind of a, a hidden plot, but like a TV series, that's going to spark your attention and indeed could therefore make you kind of pay more attention to it. But, but I think the entertainment value is also a, a valid kind of, explanation for why so many people may find these appealing at least to start with before they kind of get enrooted in it yeah they call it conspiratainment which you know and you have to agree it is entertaining and yeah. if there was no consequence of it i think it would be fabulous to kind of have this kind of 
thinking style and to be thinking through these these crazy things that happen in a potential TV series. But of course, it's not based in fiction. It's based in real life, i.e. as in the consequences are real. There's consequences to do with violence, to do with how someone acts with vaccines and climate change. They have real world kind of consequences that certainly make them entertaining, but, but certainly still very problematic. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting. I, when I've seen people um, theorize, I don't know what's going, like, for example, oh, uh, Davos, it's all the... You know the millionaires uh, meeting in Davos. They're they're controlling the world. Uh, you own nothing and you love it. And yeah, you the group. There yeah. you go. I don't even actually know too much about it. But I mean, <laughs> to be fair, but <laughs> the builder group. But I have a, I have a friend who, especially in the in the depths of, uh, or at least when COVID was uh, more, how should I put it, less controlled. Uh, right now, I feel that things have calmed down a bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I have a friend who uh, was very deep into conspiracy theories. And I just, every time that he would explain to me who's doing what the, the COVID vaccine is uh, it's not really, um, it's going to make you sicker. I'm not going to take the vaccine, blah, 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 blah. Uh, these narratives that he would have sounded way too clean to me. Like, I don't know. It's like, it's just like, this is an explanation of everything that's happening. There are no other nuances. There are no other little events that are leading to some kind of emergent of what's, you know, this constantly changing landscape that we have. Right? Random. Yeah. And then, the, the you know, the people that like, for example, uh, he'll, he would even demonize people who are trying to offer an explanation of what's going on uh, to be like, oh no, they're just trying to uh, cover it up. You know, it was, um, it wasn't really bats. It was a lab. And maybe it, listen, I'll be open. I'll be, no, it's not a problem. It's fine. I'm, I'm, but I don't like to be sold on a particular perspective until even if, all the information is, if it was a lab, I mean, what does that mean? It, the, I, right. the whole point is, right. it's just like, it's just like he loved the idea of having a clean narrative yeah. and understanding what's going on and, and, or at least having the illusion of understanding what's going on. Right. Like it added that, that sense of safety, but I, I, I think it's better to just be comfortable with the the mystery and well, yeah. so Daniel, so does that give us or you know people who kind of buy into this? Does that give? I will just say us. So does that give us an <laughs> illusion of control? Like just kind of seeing that okay, not only is the world known, but it's sort of predictable. Well, yeah, it's back to the point you mentioned earlier that you get drawn in with that promise of you're going to feel better. You have you feel like you got control. And you understand what is happening. But then it's the other side where suddenly you feel that all events in the world are therefore conspiratorial. Because at least in my experience, you never find someone who believes in just one conspiracy. It, it mm -hmm. is typically multiple different things. But of course, if you have the mindset that there are conspiracies existing, that the government has done this thing, well, it opens the question of, well, what else have they done? What else have they hidden from us and have conspired in? So a lot of these beliefs kind of hang together alongside that worldview. And indeed, in the empirical literature, we always find strong associations between different conspiracy beliefs. So sometimes if you want to learn about someone's climate change conspiracy beliefs, you ask them about 9-11 or the moon landing or other types of conspiracies because they do kind of really fall together. And I think what you mentioned a moment ago around trying to get that simple explanation, in essence, having the assumption that complex things can be explained by very simple explanations, which for the, most of the time, that is just not possible. And also sometimes trying to work out what the explanation is can take a bit of time. You, you know, scientists, experts need to actually do the research to work out what actually is happening, what caused what, you know, et cetera, which for someone who needs to have an answer immediately and kind of try and grapple with the, the crisis that they are potentially going through, that is just a little bit too long. Whereas a conspiracy ex explanation that maybe therefore fits their worldview where it paints the other group as doing bad things, it does kind of fit so naturally into their belief systems. That's why often it's been found that conspiracy theorists subjectively believe they've been a critical thinker, but objectively they are not. And, you know, potentially we all fall into that trap where we're not always as critical of information that supports our prior beliefs as we probably should be. But that also is the case, as I say, for conspiracy believers. And for someone who, you know, who reads information that supports the hatred of, a, of another group or explains the event as the government, well, that just is going to make a bit more sense. And, you know, so it's thinking around them having the perception of being a critical thinker when, when they're not. And it's kind of hard to try and navigate that path as well of 
what you believe and also what you're actually doing in reality. And I wonder, is there any way to actually reveal that aspect of themselves to them? Because, uh, I, of course, people become defensive when you challenge their beliefs, right? right. They'll yeah. feel uncomfortable, uh, yeah. go into defense mode. Uh, maybe any even or any belief, political, whatever it is, any belief is where it's right. Like, um, so that. Yeah. Pardon. I, yeah, so I, I suppose what my question is, is there any sort of a method to maybe uh, tr attempt at somehow to have maybe a, a sort of a civil way to uh, break down um, an argument, I suppose, with a conspiracy theorist? Like, uh, I understand that we would need context, right, depending on the conspiracy. Yeah. But is there any sort of generalized structure for how to communicate with somebody? Well, I always think about it as, as you mentioned, trying to target a conspiracy belief is always going to be very probably aggressive. It's going to be very under defensive on maybe both sides where you arguably trying to show the other person is wrong or right. Mm -hmm. So I kind of think about it more as trying to think about abstract, abstract, trying to understand why someone is on that journey to start with. So you could mm -hmm. ask people, that, that person in your life, whatever it is, what does this, this belief offer you? How did it start? Why did it get to this point where you have these these beliefs? Not necessarily asking what the belief is, but just kind of talk around that journey. So, for example, you know, they may talk about feeling lonely or ostracized or feeling that they were out of control. And therefore, it's trying to kind of deal with some of the psychological needs that they raise instead of dealing with the actual belief. So, for example, if they talk about, about feeling lonely, well, it's thinking about how you can kind of get them back into the community, whether it's their family or their friends or new hobbies that they may have. If they feel a bit out of control, it's kind of highlighting, well, you know, you can control things in your life. Let's think about what those things could be and get them to kind of list through things that actually have a tangible kind of impact with, their, with them as a person. So the whole aim, in my mind, is to try and help them think about the, the needs that they have, which could therefore lead them to think more clearly when it comes to actually evaluating evidence. So, you know, after that, those conversations, which hopefully would be based around understanding I mean being empathetic trying to understand that person's journey and kind of humanize them you can really highlight commonalities so that arguably you may both agree that being a critical thinker is a really good thing so therefore you could argue and share good practice around well how do you do that when you read something kind of line that makes you have an emotional reaction happy sad angry what do you do how do you check to see whether that actually is truth or misinformation. So for example, you know, do you check the bias? Do you check the source? Do you check consensus? How do you do that? What do you do? And kind of talk around some of the, the skill sets around data sharing. So all those things I mentioned are not are things around the actual conspiracy that they have and getting them to debunk it or you debunk it, but rather it's more understanding. Um, of course, with all that said, I do think those things will be quite difficult nonetheless, because mm -hmm. um, you maybe as the individual want to talk to them could be quite hard because, you know, you're trying to be an empathetic, but then you're thinking, well, oh, that's just stupid. Why are you saying these things? So it's probably trying to keep ahead on your own emotions as mm -hmm. well as trying to guide the conversation that will arguably happen over a period of time. So yeah. for me, I actually, I don't think it's about debunking, which I do think debunking can, can work. But it just depends on where that person is on the journey. If they're already having this as their belief system, it's already part of their identity, I think debunking it will be very challenging. For someone who's on the fence, who's just asking questions, he's just not sure, fair enough. Talking through the science of whatever it is to do with vaccines, climate change, fair play, that's a good a good avenue. But I was thinking more about the individual who is, you know, it's part of their identity, it's part of who they are potentially. And those kind of strategies could potentially be useful. Yeah, I love that idea because Same. I'm thinking just, you know, when I was in all of this, uh, some something that one of my professors at the time said to me was really helpful. So I, I was talking about something about like, uh, I don't remember exactly the, the, now at the time, but something about like George Washington and that like, yes, even though he was a Freemason at the time, he was actually kind of one of the better ones. I don't remember exactly. Right. So I remember so my history professor at the time tells me, he said, you know, man, he's like, you're too smart for this. Like, what are you doing? Why are you buying into this? And so for me, even though it still took a while for me to get out of that mindset, I still I took that with 
with me, and I kind of remember that. First of all, he wasn't an asshole. I appreciated him being really nice. Mm-hmm. I don't want to give him a shout out. His name is Rick Metro. So, uh, so he was really nice to me, and also he believed in me. So, what I really appreciated about that, and then I had other professors who felt the same way too. I talked about Dr. Tim Stroop in other episodes. Uh, so, but the point was is that 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 was what I think kind of molded me or shifted my kind of thinking. And so, for my for my kind of perspective, here's where I started from. So, I thought I was a free thinker. Uh, I thought I was a victim that sort of the world was out to get me. And it was, you know, it, I had no responsibility or very re- little responsibility for it. And then in terms of just the way I kind of saw people, I felt that nobody would ever understand me. You know, this is kind of like narcissistic, like, oh, I'm so unique. No one's ever going to understand me. And so that's that takes a lot. So it takes a lot of work to kind of get through that because the beliefs themselves are kind of symptomatic of that. I'm not necessarily sure if, uh, let's say, I don't know, if you kind of put me or plotted me on, uh, put me in another, like, I don't know, country, planet, whatever, if I, you know, I wouldn't have had similar types of beliefs. They may have not been conspiratorial, but they would have been, they would have had something to do with my sense of superiority or need for my sense of superiority at the time. So again, it might have not necessarily been conspiracy beliefs. So at that time, and this is what I want to talk about, is challenging the beliefs directly wouldn't have done anything for me. So when, or unless, unless you, you kind of like helped me see that, like, hey, you know, you can still hold on to some of these labels, like critical thinker, uh, you know, being a smart person, you know, in some ways still being an important part of the community, because that seems to be really important to you. And you could kind of make that work, but in another avenue. So that was really important to me. But, you know, so twofold, right? So on the one hand, yes, there was a sort of loneliness and an isolation. But again, there was also a narcissism there. There was, again, the belief that I'm special, I'm unique, I know better than other people. So I think, you know, honestly, a lot of therapy probably would have helped me at the time, more so than anything else, which I obviously didn't have. But there's that sort of that point that I think we kind of miss a lot of times because we don't want to offend people. But for a lot of conspiracy theorists, there is the belief that, yes, I am so unique and I'm so special and I'm so intelligent that these idiots just don't understand me and they probably never will. And that's such a hard barrier to get through because it's so easy to explain away anytime somebody like, let's say, you know, if you were to criticize the person you're talking about, that person could just say, oh man, you're just a sheep. It sucks. Yeah. It sucks to be you. And they just arguments down straight away. So instead, if it's more empathetic, understanding, as you say, to understand the journey, talking through some of the things you mentioned just there, it could be a much more productive conversation over a period of time that therefore may, it may lead to you talking about those beliefs later on where that person may be in a, in a different place where they're not as defensive potentially um, when you've already got that connection um, but nonetheless as I said I think these conversations are hard and that, so potentially is it thinking of other things that are much more wider so for example we know feeling empowered can help people be less likely to believe in conspiracies and this is all we've been shown in a lab so for example experiments have highlighted that if you think about all the times that you felt empowered it can reduce your belief in conspiracy theories. But of course, that is, it's not necessarily in the real world, because of course, what you do every morning, stand up and say the things that you're powerful, you know, you feel powerful. It's not a thing that will kind of stay with us. So potentially it's thinking about how our societies are made up and trying to build empowerment into workplaces, into schools. So for example, I like the ideas around procedural justice, where you perceive mm-hmm. you have, actually not perceive, you have a voice in decisions and you feel listened to, even though you may not agree with the outcome of whatever is, whatever's where, where happened, because you feel empowered, this makes you feel better. And therefore, by in, in building these, those sort of principles around, around voice and listening into the workplace, for example, it could help people feel more empowered. So when they come across a crisis, such as a, a virus outbreak or critical turmoil, they're not as, you know, dropping, dropping down the rabbit hole as, as they could be. Um, mm. And of course, things around digital literacy. So ensuring people have the skill sets to be able to evaluate evidence and know exactly how to you know to debunk something potentially uh, of course that comes with, with the bias of if you're already potentially susceptible to conspiracy theories where you have this the blinkers on it could be more difficult to kind of engage in those skill set building but nonetheless i think having the skill sets are important yeah, mm. I love that. And in, in terms of just critical thinking, now I'm thinking about it again, going back to kind of my environment. So when I grew up, I was super poor growing up. And so, I mean, not to, my schools did a decent enough job, but conspiratorial thinking wasn't really prominent at the time. So they weren't necessarily teaching critical thinking. But again, going back to sort of feeling like a victim. So there's this sort of world that you're in and kind of thrust into. And then all of a sudden you find kind of bereft of the, your basic needs. And then you're wondering, okay, but why is this happening to me? Why am I so you know disempowered? And of course, it's easy to say, well, okay, 
okay, here are these rich people. They're sucking up all of the resources. It's their fault, right? And then you're thinking, okay, what else are they doing, right? I mean, if they're like sort of this neglectful of everybody else, what, what other terrible things or nefarious things are they behind as well? And then, you know, you kind of go down the rabbit hole. But then it's so easy again to get into the trap of, oh, okay, that means none of this is my fault. My predicament has nothing to do whatsoever with me. And, you know, as a kid, that makes sense. Obviously, it doesn't. But then what does that say? I mean, I still had some responsibility to get myself or try to get myself out of it. But I think a lot of times what happens is with conspiracy thinking, and this is what really fucked me over, is I remember I got really deep into it when I was in college, and I just almost completely abandoned school at the time. So my grades were shit for probably about maybe a year or two for, for no good reason. And it was really just because I was into the literature and I would pursue that instead of my studies. And then so it became now in this case, counterproductive and self defeatist. So here on the one hand, I'm super poor trying to get out of that. And then on the other hand, I'm sabotaging my academic career. So now looking back on that, I'm like, fuck, man, fuck conspiracy theories, man. If you get <laughs> this, if I just didn't get myself into this, my life would have probably been way better. I mean, probably not 100% true, but still, you know, and that's what kind of sucks, man, you get into this counterproductive mindset, and you really just you sabotage your life like that mm, a really good points and really highlights the role of the perception of being a victim perceptual and, and actually being a victim and yeah. how it can really get you on that journey and how you, we try and intervene with that journey i think is really really troubling because for someone who has gone through something whatever it is by saying or oh, just just think more critically i don't know if that actually would work because they'd be, you'd be thinking well i am being critical in that particular right. moment so i also think thinking how we help with that journey, particularly for someone who has gone through something, been the victim to do with their, their group identity, something that's happened to them, trauma, how we kind of help with that, I think is a question for the, the future as well. Us being both researchers, but also, you know, the society, how we kind of support those individuals, because I think it's a, it's a route to conspiracy theories that, that is often not always talked about. You know, more often than not, it's thinking around the the needs of uh, in the environment or the personality. But instead, it could also be these experiences that that we can go through from a young age. Yeah, and this might be sort of one of the most cliche questions you can sort of ask, but it is important, I think. Uh, so, how could somebody differentiate between a sort of a baseless uh, uh, conspiracy theory and one that actually has credibility? Because you could argue, I mean, there technically there there have been actual conspiracies that have occurred. It just tends to be that a lot of them are are wrong. And, you know, just the again, as we said earlier, just these nice, clean narratives. Somebody's in control. I'm the victim and right. that sort of thing. But there could be something legitimate going on that maybe people are just calling a conspiracy theory and then sort of dismissing it and not using critical thinking. Right. Really good points, and off well, the times that things have come out, it's always been by journalists, by whistleblowers, by internal reports in in that organisation, the government, for example. It's never been kind of brought out by a group of conspiracy conspiracy believers at home. It's always been people doing their job. So mm -hmm. I always always kind of wonder in my own mind as well, like if we had, if there was, if there is, was more trust in journalism and believing that these individuals would bring out a potential cover-up as they have done previously but sometimes uh, trust isn't always there with journalism and I in my mind think that even though there could be a bias of that newspaper that magazine I still think someone would find it like as in someone would be looking for for that particular um red herring or whatever it is and then bring it out to the surface and of course uh, people inside the organization as well highlighting that these things have happened um mm. so for me i suppose it's thinking around consensus therefore as in what is the consensus at that particular time on that particular issue like take climate change you know the overwhelming amount of people scientists are saying it actually is happening and it's caused by us but um but if you kind of look at the specifics those who are more likely to doubt whether it's happening you know, who may be scientists but they're not scientists in that particular field if you look at that particular field who actually know what they're talking about that particular thing, they're saying, yes, it is happening. When you kind of move away from that center and, you know, that person maybe is a scientist, but not in that particular field, they're just broadly, you know, in that field of environmental science, suddenly gets a little bit more, more, more interesting. So, so I think consensus and seeing, okay, what are other people saying about this? What are scientists saying? And, you know, is there 
change in potentially kind of scientific facts. Of course, you know, things can change over time when there's more experiments, more evidence, you know, things change. So looking towards what the consensus is could be a good way, but also somehow trying us trying to instill more trust in our United institution, that, that being like journalists, for example, trying to who we who are the ones who uncover these things. Um and how we do that, I really don't know. But I just I just know from the past that's how they've brought out conspiracies or been, you know, shown that conspiracy is happening. So how do how do we kind of build more trust in those people? <laughs> Yeah, no, for sure. And I also think about even just my own personal experiences, um, even considering how much information I take in, and then what I base what I think I know. uh, So here's the thing, for example, like during COVID, for example, if there were there were not dirt, I mean, it's still a thing. (laughs) But no, no, it's over a month, you didn't hear? (laughs) No, but uh, for example, when people were saying, uh, oh, this vac- the particular vaccine's not safe, RNA this, uh, um, you know, uh, Johnson and Johnson that, or this one's causing blood clots, and this is whatever, uh, that that sort of thing. Um, in order for me to have been able to even attempt to have as much information as I possibly could to make an informed decision, I would really have to read through every, uh, uh, like all the research, right? Uh, As many journals that have published whatever uh, research on uh, different COVID vaccines, uh, look at what almost basically every scientist, every doctor has said on the on the subject, and then somehow integrate all of that into having an informed sort of uh, ability to make a decision. (laughs) And the thing is, I guarantee, well, I can't, I can't say that I guarantee this, but the amount of people who actually would do that mm-hmm. or attempt to do that, um, it, it's well, incredibly low. Expertise as well. Like you can do exactly what you've explained, have the time to do it. But if you haven't got the expertise to be able to that evaluate and to know what makes something good and something bad and to be able to think, okay, well, actually there's quite a consensus here showing that this is actually is happening, but the concept is all based on poor research design. It's flawed in all different ways. So it's not even just the time as you've indicated, it's also being able to understand and evaluate in that particular skill set. And while she may have critical thinking abilities in general to think through the evidence, you actually need to know what you're talking about. Like even as being a psychologist, you know, I'm a social psychologist at the start. So that's, I'm interested in people and understanding how our beliefs form, etc. But there are psychologists who look into children, who look into uh, sport, who look into neurodivergent. Now, we're all psychologists, but there's no way I could explain, for example, to do with uh, different brain waves and how our brain forms, whatnot. I don't know why, no, I've got no idea. So I could Absolutely. read many papers about that particular, you know, format and how people do experiments with the brain, but I wouldn't know. I couldn't tell whether that was a good or bad experiment. No, I can certainly tell you if it's good or bad in social psychology, but where I know it's my bread and butter, but certainly not in that field. But nonetheless, I would be a psychologist. So if someone asks my opinion as a psychologist, I say, no, all the experiments are fantastic. You know, I that I'm then got a tick next to my name, but actually you know, I wouldn't really know whether it's good or bad. So I do think actually it's not just being critical, it's also actually knowing your stuff, which of course is very, very unique, um, you know, to be able to be the expert in that field. So um, it is a lot of trust to put into the consensus of those experts. But for me, I suppose having the bias of being, you know, a psychologist, being a scientist who understands how consensus is built and to have that trust, I do come from that kind of uh, privilege in a way to have the trust in understanding Whereas someone who maybe isn't obviously part of the scientific community doesn't understand how things work, you can certainly see how it's kind of well, what kind of works for what I believe. Right. And exactly. With- and, and just just to put a rib, uh, bow on it, yeah, yeah uh, I think just knowing that you don't uh, like, for example, like for example, I should know that I don't have all the information, or I'm not an expert, for example, in a particular field, and I should integrate that into my own uh, critical thinking when Mm. I'm trying to make an informed decision. Like I really should defer to experts, right? Uh, And then uh, look at what the consensus of experts are are saying. Um, Otherwise, I mean, what what else can you do as an individual, right? I mean, I've based uh, information that like I think is true on very little things like clickbaity titles Mm. of, of articles, thinking that 
that title just told me everything I need to know. I don't need to read that entire paper. Even if you did read that entire paper, okay, congratulations, you're at level one <laughs> of having read that particular paper. Yeah. You're yeah. not you haven't even read what this other particular source mm -hmm. has to say. Right. So yeah, but sorry, you know, you know, you know what's so interesting about that, right? So I was gonna say, uh, when you're in a conspiracy mindset, so this is how I thought of it. So I was an expert geologist, so I would look to like Graham Hancock and these people, and I'm like, yes, I can tell you about the Younger Dryas, and I could tell you about how, like, you know, the Earth was uh whatever bombarded by like a comet a ages ago or whatever. If you look into like Emmanuel Velikovsky and his ideas, uh, so whatever. So, but the point is that you're sort of a, you convince yourself that you're an expert in all of these different fields. So it's like you tell yourself you're an expert in geology, you're an expert in archaeology, that you can kind of read the data there. Uh, you tell yourself you're an expert in psychology because you really understand what humans are like. Uh, you're an expert in politics and geopolitics, government histories. So, But you can't be an expert in all of these things. Mm -hmm. But what's so interesting is the kind of lies that we tell ourselves as conspiracy theorists. We tell ourselves that, yeah, no, with just a little bit of time and a little bit of data that we can actually get a sort of a, a decent sense of what's going on with the world or what's been going on. And what's funny is that when I used to get into arguments and debates with people, they would would say something and this was like in the conspiracy circles they would say something to me like well you know i don't know about this but give me like a couple of minutes and then i'll come back to you i'm like what a couple of minutes and legitimately these people would read like an article or two and they would come back and they would say things like oh, okay i know everything about the subject now i'm ready to debate you and i'm like what you read like an article online and you think you know everything about it but that is the mentality the mentality is that there's very little to know and if um not to get into this too much but i remember if and also by the way you're an expert in finance and economics too so for the people who are like the end the fed conspiracy theorists here this is the mantra the mantra was finance and economics is actually super simple uh what these people do is they obfuscate them they make them really difficult for normal people to figure out but really if you're talking about money management it's actually the simplest thing in the world right you everybody can understand it i guess that's nice in the sense of like you know they're telling you like hey joe schmo you can get it too but no it's not like that you're telling me you understand federal reserve policy but that is the mentality the mentality is that no 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 it's over complicated you could literally just with the a little bit of your time understand the entire financial system yeah so if it's that simple right if only it was that simple <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and, so and again read the data be able to get the data but then read it yeah and maybe it goes back to that point of people believing that they are being a critical critical thinker subjectively but you know, objectively they are not because maybe they haven't got the skills to actually do that in that particular field so I suppose when we think about digital literacy, it's thinking around, well, how do we check consensus? Well, we, what do we do? do we, how, how do we look for bias? Not necessarily understanding the data itself yourself, but rather, okay, who's saying it? Is it just one particular person or is there multiple, multiple people saying the same thing? Um, it's an interesting way to think about how we try and deal with these issues. Yeah. And it's also interesting how we think we have to know everything too, because again, going back to the sense of control, the idea I think is very black and white. It's that you either are stupid and you know nothing, or you have to know everything about the way the world functions. And going back into the sort of the loneliness and the isolation of it, there's a deep distrust of people in the sense of like, I can't trust the experts. And I know we get that a lot, especially with medical conspiracy. So uh, so somebody I know, I don't want to reveal too much about this person. Uh, it's not so much of an issue now, thank God, but when we were younger, it was where, so it's a she, so she would kind of do her research on medical issues and thank God, this is not an issue anymore. Uh, but she would say, well, yeah, I don't trust doctors. Right. And I'm like, okay, but so what are you saying? You're saying with a little bit of research on whatever it is, you know, vaccines, et cetera, she was really anti-vax for a while. So is she, you're telling me that you, you understand like how to keep yourself healthy. But then when you look at kind of the clinical presentation and she really struggled struggles with like OCD and other anxiety disorders. The idea is essentially like the world is untrustworthy. So I need to be able to take my own health into my own hands. So then, you know, you fall into like the, the Gwyneth Paltrow's of the world and goop and whatever else, like these kind of, uh, what would you call them? Uh, like these alternative me medicine, natural paths, like these type of people. So you fall into that because essentially it's not even so much that, um, it's not even so much that it's not so complicated. That's certainly an aspect of it, but it's also like do it yourself. So people love and decide like do it yourself medicine where the idea is like, okay, I, now I don't have to fear going to a doctor anymore because as long as I take care of it myself through certain herbal remedies, uh, through plants that I could find God knows where concoctions that I can make at home. Now I can kind of care for myself. And it's so scary, man, to think that like on the one hand, yes, you do feel like you're in control of your health. And I'm sure that has some significant mental health benefits. But then on the other hand, when time actually, when the time comes, you don't trust the experts when you need to. And then that's when crises happen. But thank God for this person, like as finally COVID happened, she started to see like, oh shit, I probably 
probably should get vaccinated. And then little by little, she's like, wow, I can't believe I kind of used to believe in this stuff. I'm like, thank God it's over. Thank God. <laughs> and the way you were thinking, it's just also interesting how we all do it, but when we talk about a group who really overgeneralize, it's all doctors, it's all government officials, Black it's and white. all scientists. It's such a big sweeping statement in a way. And obviously that's often that's what the conspiracy theory is kind of based on. It's never that particular individual in that government. It is the US government, UK yeah. government. It's the royal family in UK. It's the whole royal family. So when you when you're talking, I really just thought doctors, like it's every every single doctor, like ev- like that's a that's a lot of doctors. But you're thinking NASA, the whole is the whole so it's often so sweeping that it doesn't really tangibilize the actual clog in that system. So I do also wonder if there was more understanding of how the government works. So they can think of the UK particularly, how Parliament works, how who your MP is, who works in your local area, what they get up to and kind of knowledge about the actual clog in the system. I really would wonder if people would think, well, actually, they can actually do this conspiracy. Like, wow, they can actually do that. I don't think they could. Like, some of the events are so complicated and there would be so many people involved that it, it would just be easier just to, like... Do it, not actually, you know, for example, I sort of saw, it reminds you from Adam Adam Rooms, everything, Adam Mm -hmm. Rooms, everything, actually, where we think about the moon landing, that at the time, it would have took so many people and so much technology that was above its head its time to fake the moon landing, it would have been easier just to go, which also makes you think around, well, you know, these are just such sweeping statements and... Actually, if you think about the logistics of it, it kind of falls apart, at least in my mind. And, yep. you know, so therefore understanding of how things work, how science works, how the government works may change someone's perception of, well, actually, I don't think they could have done this. <laughs> By the way, you know what she would have said to you? She would have actually had a great answer. So if you right. would have told her like, OK, yeah, so what are you saying? Like all of these doctors are in cahoots? She would say, oh, no, of course course not why would i think that she would say something along the lines of like they just care about money so they don't have to be in cahoots they don't have to all be doing the same thing it's just remember black and white thinking they're all profit driven so they're always going to do what's best for them so meaning that they're never going to care about the health of their patients they're never going to care about who they're harming essentially as long as the bottom line is you know in the short term it's helping them that's the only thing that matters so technically in her version nobody even really needs to be in cahoots because humanity is so fundamentally selfish (laughs) and greedy yeah they're so fundamentally greedy if she met one well that person met one person who changed their perception yeah and ideally meet a few doctors who actually are very different and move the mold would that change that person's thinking because yeah. we do know that you know positive contact with those who are different from us can reduce negativity and you know that could also be the case for conspiracy beliefs that having contact with people and seeing actually people are very diverse and very different and this can make us think, therefore, a bit more critically, could it reduce belief in conspiracies? So, uh, yeah, it's just really interesting how uh, that one statement, and as you say, or, well, everyone's like this, you know. And, of course, we talk, talk about the government, about doctors and nurses. But, of course, there's many conspiracies around minority group members, such as Jewish people. And, you know, these conspiracies have been going around for a very long time, where I suspect the answer to that question would be, well, all Jewish people want to do this. But it's such a sweeping statement that goes across, you know, many millions of people. It just, it's just fascinating as well. <laughs> yeah. No, and it's, it's very interesting how people will uh, invent rationalizations to preserve that that base belief, right? Like that general belief that, oh, people are not trustworthy, they're greedy, right? right? Anytime you'll give them any kind of, like, for example, it's not all doctors, and then she'll just come up with another rationalization. Mm, it's, 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 that's, <laughs> yeah, it's. It's actually it's very interesting. It's very interesting that we do that. But it, when you can identify what that base belief is in that person, yeah. that is interesting. That that is where you could yeah. attempt to uh, so yeah maybe build it. rapport. Yeah, but as I mentioned, I think someone mentioned before, it's a symptom, really, isn't it? All these things is a symptom, and you know people believe in multiple conspiracy theories. So if you debunk one, well, the others may just stay intact. So if you go to that central thing and try to understand that some of that person's journey to where they are. I think it's more much more productive than trying to deal with the various conspiracies that the person may indeed be holding on to. 
Yeah, and I mm-hmm. love that. And in CBT and cognitive behavioral therapy, we would call these core beliefs. So core beliefs about yourself, about other people, mm-hmm. about the world around you. So yeah, so for a lot of people, especially again, myself included in all of this, I don't want to, you know, kind of stigmatize anybody, but myself included. So there was a belief that the world is essentially fundamentally greedy and untrustworthy. So of course, like all of these things are going to be true. That's what kind of it is with conspiracy theories too. Sometimes even if you don't have a good argument for a specific conspiracy theories, a theory, you can just say, well, okay, maybe this one isn't true, but like, of course they're doing something. Of course, there's something evil going on, like the government, right? The government is a good example of this. We can say something like, okay, let's say, uh, I don't know, some, I don't know, you just give, make up anything, right? Something with Biden, let's say, was debunked, right? You could say, okay, well, maybe that's not true, but he's a politician. Of course, he's doing something nefarious. And then it's like, okay, what do you do with that, right? Now you're obviously going into core belief territory because now you're asking the person, what? wait, why would you think that? Like, yes, in some sense, politicians, and you know, we could look at the data, we could say they do lie to a substantial extent extent, maybe 20, whatever, 30% of the time, which sucks, but it's the truth. And we could say, okay, they're definitely not perfect. I mean, they have their flaws. And yeah, of course, they're selfish. I mean, in some sense, I mean, they're politicians, they want to be in front of the camera, they want to be adored, uh, they want to seem to be important. That's great. That's fine. All of that is true. But do we say that just because that's true, on the other hand, also that they're seemingly so greedy that they, I don't know, let's say they're, um, they're sort of disavowing any responsibility or absolving themselves of any responsibility for the common good. And then I would ask, okay, but then how does that work? work? How does the, how does a person do that? And then the answer could be, well, everybody's selfish. So nobody even cares. They just let them do whatever they want. And again, it goes back to this fundamental belief of just people are shit. Yeah. Just to add something to that. It's, it's very interesting. Like what helped me uh, maybe change. Well, hard to say if I know for sure, if I've changed any core beliefs, Mm -hmm. but let's, let's pretend, right. Uh, For me, it's very helpful that when I learned that whatever it is that you believe you look for evidence for, uh, to confirm in your environment. So then I just one day, well, not one day, but I, I attempted to uh, borrow other beliefs uh, because maybe my existing map of the world wasn't serving me. Right. So I'm like, oh, I'd like to change. I'd like to maybe think more critically. I'd like to maybe see that people around me are friendlier. So maybe I, instead of thinking everybody's greedy and wants something from you, which there's that's definitely true. People, to some extent. For sure. Yeah. But the moment I started believing, oh, the world's a friendly place. Uh, everybody's your friend. It's a little delusional, gra- uh, granted, sure. But if you do believe something like that, you actually do look for evidence of it and you try to find reference experience of that to confirm that. And then it sort of solidifies that into your uh, map of the world. And then you could actually it, it's very interesting how playing with uh those sort of core beliefs. I, I know we're stepping away. No, 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 I love it. You know what? What's funny? Yeah. So he said this before, but it's also funny. So the, you are the originator of this. But what I'm thinking is, remember in the movie Everything, Everywhere, All at Once? That was the guy. Remember he? He was like, yeah, I choose to see like the good in the world. Sorry. Sure. Yeah, that's kind of it. So you sort of you sort of act as if you know you yeah. you, you think to yourself like, yes, I know I could focus on the bad parts, but I don't fucking want to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think you should uh, be aware of them both, to have yeah. a more complete, integrated view of the world, and not have uh, you ha- you want as little blind spots as possible. But in- inevitably, you will have blind spots yeah. by believing one particular thing, yeah. or or even even if you think you're on you're you're this evolved person who has uh, these multiple perspectives and that you're integrating. I I like to think of myself as that, but even then, I know. There's definitely something I'm missing and and other people will give you that feedback and yeah. you just have to be open to it. That's interesting that you say that. So Daniel, so does that come up in your research acting as if, or at least believing as if, and if that affects conspiratorial beliefs where you're telling the person, okay, let's try to experiment. Let's see what would happen if one day in your life, you didn't think that everybody was a piece of shit who was after you, or at least, you know, in it for themselves. What do you think would be like? What do you think the responses would be like? Uh, what do you think some of the reactions would be like? And essentially what does happen? Would you want to experiment with that? That's really, that's a really cool experiment. So what I what I what I know of, no, no one's done exactly that. So it's really cool. Well, Alan, so Alan has. has. Yeah, so but you should, like, research, what, you, should, yeah. I, what I think, I think it would really depend on how in depth that belief is in that person. So as in, if you got even to imagine the what ifs, but their worldview is that they're full of conspiracies, they have this strong distrust. I don't know if they could imagine it. I, I think they would in that moment. You can't please, you might imagine it now in your mind. Pause for a minute. Imagine it. What the hell? No way. Like they just, I don't think they could do it. So, whereas someone who's maybe on, on, on the fringes, in the middle, uh, they're maybe more susceptible to be everything. Oh, actually, actually, yeah, I can see both sides of this. 
Um, that's just me theorizing. I just, I just think, I just know that these beliefs are so in, intrude that this worldview is so important to them. I just don't think they could see through it, even in a imagination ex exercise. Because often, mm -hmm. um, when it comes to thinking around or your out group, groups are different to you in a very positive way. For those individuals who have really strong negativity, who who like really dislike that group, they find it really difficult to mm. see that group in a really positive way. So I wonder, would a similar thing happen here? Would it be only those who are on the on the fringes who could do it, whereas those who are strong not? But I think it's worth a question ask, ask it, you know, asking and researching. So if there are psychologists out there who could do such an experiment, it'd be quite cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hundred percent. Yeah. Cause that, that's yeah. technically what happens a lot of times in therapy where you do, that's the concept of in behaviorism of acting as if where it's like, this. that's what Alan was saying. Like go out into the world, essentially try to be friendly, see what happens. So maybe you'll get different responses. And you know what, if you don't, you can come back and you could shove it in my face and you could say, <laughs> hi, you were right. You, you called it. People are shed, <laughs> you know, whatever. Fine. I, I give up, you know, you, you win. So I think a lot of times uh, that's helpful or it could be helpful because essentially what you're doing is you're gathering more data. And I think a lot of times with the data, I mean, sometimes this isn't true but a lot of times when the data is so in your face and so conflicting it becomes very much harder to resist it mm. so the strength of the evidence yeah so it's, it's back to that understanding what makes good evidence and what makes bad evidence and, and there could be a lot of it but it means good i suppose <laughs> so it's always back trying to evaluate stuff that we may we don't always understand yeah yeah and then so Daniel, did you want mm. uh yeah i was just uh, wondering um because of course we've addressed this by saying that people should definitely uh, critically think, embrace, uh, nuance, um, inquire about what it is that they they believe. Um, how 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 do you think maybe mental health professionals can can help people who um, with with concerns related to belief and conspiracies? Because it might not just be oh you know critically think, be mm -hmm. nuanced about mm -hmm. it. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so why I think all the things we talked about, like what you mentioned earlier about CBT, in a way, it's getting to that core right. beliefs. And yeah. so I do think it's the same conversations that I can't imagine, for example, in therapy, going through that particular conspiracy theory around vaccines or climate change or the moon landing, but rather it's going through the core beliefs and that someone's anxiety or their trauma in their life, trying to understand that journey. So, so for me, it's back to that point of, not necessarily debunking which i suppose when you think about conspiracy theories you may just think oh i need to debunk it that's what i need to do that's how i address this belief but i certainly i, I certainly think it's very different which is kind of what we discussed as well i think it's different mm -hmm. way to approach it and how those discussions i just don't think will be helpful because that belief is kind of being held really tight Right. And you know, it's so funny. Michael Shermer would have said the same thing. He said something along the lines of, yeah, he said something along the lines of, he said, look, you can't debunk every single conspiracy theory. It's just not possible. So what you're looking for is you're looking for themes, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. one could be government control. Another could be aliens or reptilians. And then another one could be, uh, let's say, uh, I don't know, let's say uh, uh, sort of, uh, what are they called? Like Atlantis or, you know, past, civ past civilizations or whatever. He's like, look, you're not going to debunk every single theory no. because there's so many of them going around. But what you can do is you can focus on themes and you can ask yourself okay what's the evidence that any in terms of again lumping these together what's the evidence that these particular themes come up in history like where do you actually see that where can you find a proof but yeah you're not going to take he's like first of all we're not experts in all of these different fields right so let's say again going back i mentioned before let's say geology archaeology right i can't debunk that there was an atlantis i mean i don't even know how to do that what am i gonna say i can't do that right so but like yes the fact of a you know past civilization i think in some sense we can because outside of let's say you know certain myths you would say okay where Here's the actual physical evidence of this. Yes, we have these myths, but then also in terms of myths, people make up a lot of stuff. And I mean, yes, there's some similarities, but then you can also point to the differences in the myths. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of times what happens is people only in hyper focus on the similarities. So, right, mm -hmm. that you don't necessarily have to be a particular expert in any uh, field, but you can focus on themes. But that's obviously getting into kind of the minutia of conspiracy theories. Right. And, and I think I'm wondering, actually, maybe this is a better question, actually. Uh, in terms of social media and oh, that's a good one. Yeah. So, um, I know conspiracy theories have been around forever. Yeah. Before the internet, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Somebody, way before. Way before, yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. even if somebody were to say, let's, I'm sure this is probably cliche. They they would say something like, uh, oh well, uh. You know, with the internet, uh, we have uh, 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 over a billion users uh, of the internet, and 
Um, we have these algorithms that create echo chambers and people are on their phones all the time. So surely um, and any any sort of uh, conspiracy theories or just uh, misinformation uh, that gets spread more often. Is there any truth to that or any research that supports uh, that? It, it, it varies. So some people really do think that indeed that there are echo chambers, but that potentially it's those individuals who are, who, who were already susceptible to this type of thinking, who may have indeed had this thinking, if internet wasn't here, they would still be thinking this way. Yep. But I do certainly imagine that if someone is exposed to the same thing over and over on their time feed about, you know, this outgroup or this event, that this over time can change what you think. But we know with misinformation that repeat exposure can actually increase your perception that it's true because we kind of have a truth bias and that repeat exposure to make you just think, oh yeah, I've seen that multiple times, that must be true. So I do think certainly seeing the same thing over and over and over and over again in different ways, in different ways of, of media could potentially change your way of thinking over a period of time. But there's certainly no data to suggest that conspiracy theories are much more popular today than they've been before. They seem to have always been popular. And what has changed maybe is just the way we think about them, as in we being scientists and scholars and the government and journalists, in the sense that we now can see these things, we can put a spotlight on it. We can see the trend on Twitter, people talking about these issues, whereas, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. So... Is it the, the perception that it feels like they're much more widespread and they're, they're in our veins when actually they've kind of been in the corner all this time, just now there's a, a, a light on it? Um, but of course, as I say, I do think that repeat exposure is still problematic. So mm -hmm. it's just really difficult to kind of map someone's journey of how they got to that particular point and how fast they got there. Um, but even, even that said, I imagine the repeat exposure and then something happens to you, so traumatic or indeed need based, that that belief could really kind of form in amongst itself. Um, so the Internet is a really fascinating thing. And again, your gut suggests that it's 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 the cause of all this, but it's just enabling it, I suppose. And even with that Internet, it would still be here. I kind of always think about it as conspiracy theories on steroids. They're just <laughs> a little bit more intense on the Internet. <laughs> Right, I love that. And so as we start wrapping up, I want to kind of focus on something you just said, popularity. So what are some of the most conspiracy or the popular, what are the most popular conspiracy theories today? Well, of course, there's, there's still lots of rhetoric around climate change conspiracy theories. And although there's been lots of attention and work on it, there's still a lot of people thinking it's not happening. Uh, of course, vaccines, things to do with different types of vaccines is still a very topical issue. Um, so that often, often has always been here, well, that often comes up, is conspiracies about, about different people. So Jewish people, there's a lot of conspiracies around those individuals. In broadly, immigration, there's a lot of conspiracies around kind of plotting and scheming with regards to that. And then what you find is that there's lots of different governmental conspiracies. So 9-11 is still quite, indeed, still quite popular. But of course, it really kind of depends on the country and what is going on. Um, naturally, COVID-19 still has conspiracies about it, which of course can dabble with vaccines, but also still with the causes. So pretty much any large difficult event has at least one conspiracy associated. Often events have multiple conspiracies because, you know, as long as it's pointing the finger at the powerful, the perceived powerful and blaming them for the wrongdoing, it doesn't mm. matter what the actual theory is, as long as it kind of has that central ingredient. So mm. often, you know, many events, well, the events have many conspiracies. COVID can be caused by Bill Gates to the Chinese to 5G. All these things hang to, can hang together because they point the finger at a pair for people. Wow. Yeah. And then, so how important is transparency, transparency then? So my thinking is in terms of uh, kind of making these processes more known. I mean, yeah, I guess I wonder because you could definitely, okay, whatever. I want to, cause I want you to answer the question, but I, you can definitely kind of go around it and say, well, of course they're going to say things like that, but just in general, right? How important would transparency be, especially in terms of government agencies, because we don't know much about how bureaucracy works. I don't think very many people do. And then also just in terms of uh, vaccines, how vaccines are produced, what the process is like, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of back to like knowledge is power kind of argument right. where having an under, understanding of behind the, behind the tin and seeing how things work can 
it kind of give you that reassurance. You say, oh, this is how things work. And so mm-hmm. obviously when the COVID-19 vaccine was, was being rolled out, there was lots of public health campaigns around explaining what the vaccine is, in particular for community leaders to go into the community to talk to people who maybe are distrusting to explain how the vaccine has been made. So I really do think, in, in essence, that science communication kind of building that rapport between the doctors, nurses, and whoever else is involved, for example, and the community is particularly Mm. important. Um, As I say, with the government, it'd be interesting just to see, does understanding about the government kind of help kind of shape someone's belief systems? And I, you know, I would like to think it would do, where someone thinks, well, actually, the, the government is a lot more complex than just the government, and how that could kind of shape someone's belief. Yeah, you know what show? So I was just looking it up. What show I really loved with uh, so the guy who made Adam Ruins Everything, Adam Conover. So he made this show called on Netflix The G Word. If you guys have ever seen it, I loved it. So it's like it's on the one hand boring and entertaining at the same time. So Obama's in it too. So it's pretty much it's a series like just like Adam Ruins Everything, and it's on different government processes. So he'll tackle like money, right? How how does the Federal Reserve run? Uh, he'll tackle uh, let's say the IRS at like these different cover again bureaucracies, right? These different institutions, and essentially little by little. And then Obama kind of is, uh, he's he's sort of challenging Obama on the show too. It's not really serious, but it's also somewhat important. Um, and then so what happens on the show is you learn little by little how these systems work and also how they fail to work. So what I love about the show is he's actually pretty critical of them. So what's so great about something like this being on Netflix is that I've actually seldom seen shows that are critical of the United States government, unless obviously these extremes, unless you're talking about conspiracy theories. So what's great about Adam is, and I'm, assure, I'm assuming him and Obama are friends, so I mean, it's probably, it is what it is, but he even, he does criticize him. He's like, you know, hey, look, man, we expected more from you. Like, you know, even with healthcare, there are these struggles that we're having. Why is this still going on? Uh, you know, especially, oh, he even he challenged him on the drones. He was like, what's up with that? Like, how are you just like, killing civilians? And, you know, Obama's like, yeah, you know, you're right. You're right about like these are legitimate criticisms. So I love shows like that because they're super complicated and then also super simple. So they're nuanced in the sense that they take the good and the bad. And they also show the public like, hey, you do your concerns. At least some of them are fairly legitimate. Mm. That's what it's making it entertaining. So suddenly the mundane of the governmental backdrop and how it works suddenly comes a little more entertaining that therefore could kind of sit slightly on situ with a conspiracy theory that of course we know is entertaining. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, Alan. Any final questions for Daniel before we wrap up? Oh yes. Uh, if we wanted to follow your uh follow your work uh, and follow you, where could we find you? So I'm on Twitter at Dr. Daniel Jolly, or I post Semi regularly on my website at danieljolly.co.uk. Excellent. Awesome. Daniel, thank you so thank much you so for much coming for on. on. Such a Pleasure. great episode. Thanks for the questions. They've been great. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Thanks. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. All right. That was awesome. All right. So, everyone, if you want to follow us, you can follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter, where it's Seize underscore podcast. Like, subscribe, hit, hit the, the bell, bell on YouTube. YouTube. And again, thank you so much for watching and see you next time.